Well, I, I thank you all for, for being here today. This has just been very overwhelming. I haven't been able to get home in eight years for family reasons. So I've been really looking forward to this. It's, it's wonderful. Big thanks to Tim for arranging all of this. Um, last year when we were in all in COVID lockdown, Tim and I both separately were working on family histories and he discovered we're related. <laughs> so, um, and I could not bring all of my books with me without needing another suitcase, so I copied the covers to the ones that I particularly like and they're laying over here if you want to look at them later. Um, oh, I haven't turned this on yet. Oh, there it is. It's on. It's on. And I'm talking about it. Um, I've been asked to tell you all about my various careers in history and museums and writing. Um, they've taken me many places, sometimes put me in some very awkward situations, but have allowed me to meet well-known people such as Dr. Jane Goodall. Oh, and that's my first story. In the late 1970s, uh, Sweetwater hosted a series of programs by renowned anthropologists and scientists. Dr. Catherine Seaman headed the program. She was my advisor. And um, she invited me to come and listen to the lectures whenever I could get away from the museum. On this particular trip to Sweetbar, Dr. Goodall and her husband, Derek Bryson, a member of the Tanzanian Parliament, were to fly, after the, her program, they were to fly from Lynchburg to DC where she was going on to her next presentation. But the airport here was completely fogged in. So um, it, since Bill had come with me that day, Dr. Seaman asked us if we would drive them to DC. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> One of the most famous scientists on the earth and a member of the, the Tanzanian Parliament. <laughs> uh, and we had a lovely time. We talked all the way to Washington and back. Um, well, they didn't come back. Um, <laughs> so we got to the airport and Bill and I helped them get their belongings out and into the, into the terminal. And Derek invited us to stay and have coffee. Well, that's okay. Until he reached into his bag and pulled out a big bottle of bourbon and started dumping it into all of it. <laughs> you know, back then you just didn't sit in the airport uh, area and drink bourbon. And I spent the whole time worrying about being jailed with one of the most world's one of the world's most eminent scientists and a leading member of the Tanzanian Parliament. I don't think I breathed until we got out of there that day. But it was just fascinating. Um, Having, having her to ourselves, so to speak. I also met anthropologist Dr. John, Don Johansson, the discoverer of Lucy, which changed everyone's understanding of early hominids. He sent all the students he taught at Sweetbar into gales of giggles by referring to his girlfriend as his mate. That was very shocking to them. They'd never heard that before. Um, Princess Anne of Great Britain, I didn't get to shake her hands, but we did wave to each other as she um, walked by after touring Ashton Villa, an historic house in uh, Galveston, Texas, where I later worked. However, not only did I shake the hand of the head curator of the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, but I got to tour him through Ashton Villa. And I was terrified the entire time that I would say something wrong. I've shared meals with Oprah's private chef in Sweden and stood on stages there and in Frankfurt, Germany to accept awards. My work has had its ups and downs, but it's brought me great satisfaction. It's just enough money to keep me doing this crazy job, and I get a lot of good stories out of it. Well, as many of you here know, I was born in Lynchburg. Daddy was a banker, so we moved around a lot until we reached Amherst in 1963. And Amherst became and still is home. Now, this class of 70 in the class, in the end here, how many of you remember Dr. Uh, Mr. White, our history teacher. Yeah. Well, he always liked to tease me about how I pronounced Rasputin. Apparently, it was excessively funny. Um, but he also taught me that I could make a career out of history. And in many ways, he set me on this path and probably had no clue what he was letting loose. But I, I thought about him a lot. Another history teacher has also been very important in my life. Um, the first time I saw Bill McElroy, he was at the bottom of a deep pit. He was digging at an archaeological excavation in Wingina. Now, he doesn't remember me from those days. I wasn't terribly memorable back then, but I never forgot him. And uh, those of you who studied at CBCC probably had classes with him. 
Hey, Shirley. My sister-in-law. Um, when I began, I began my first year in Sweetbriar in the aftermath of Hurricane Camille, as did we all going off to college that year from Amherst High. Um, strangely enough, I would be later selected to work on the Aftermath of Camille Project, sponsored by the National Science Foundation and based out of Sweetbriar. My favorite teacher at Sweetbriar was Dr. Catherine Seaman, who taught anthropology and was my major advisor and encouraged me to go after what I loved. Another uh, professor there was Jim Ramsey. He was only at Sweetbriar in one year. Uh, he taught art and he specialized in Mesoamerica, which I'd always been very interested in. And when he learned of my interest in the subject, he began teaching me Nahuatl, which is the language of the Aztecs. And basically, I don't get much opportunity anymore to, to uh, decipher it. Um, and let me just say right here, Sweetbar's name has opened many doors for me since I graduated, for which I'm very grateful. Sweetbar's name is really, really goes around. While I was studying at Sweetbriar, the idea of a county museum arose. It started as a bicentennial project in the mid, um, early to mid 1970s. Every county in the state seemed like had to have a museum. So work began on building one here in Amherst. Uh, the Amherst Women's Club, which my mom was in, Bicentennial Committee, my Nellison Women's Club, Amherst County Extension Homemakers, the Amherst Rotary Club, and several other groups all got involved in this. Mama kind of dragged me into it, hoping to distract me from a recently busted romance. Not Bill, this was somebody else. Um, but I became really interested and I contacted anyone I could think of who might be able to help us. Strangely enough, I remembered Bill McElroy from that long ago when John and Dick and I wrote him. Uh, he was and still is an excellent photographer and he, when he met me at Sweetbar that afternoon, um, he suggested that we go around the county and shoot photos of historic and endangered properties and buildings so that we could put together a program and take it to show other people, okay, you've got all this here, this is good stuff, and we need to be conserving it. I didn't know it, but that was their first date. <laughs> uh, and about five weeks later, I was engaged in writing my honors thesis on forming a museum for Amherst County. Uh, I'm happy and somewhat amazed still that the thesis resulted in my graduating with high honors and with the school's first interdepartmental major in history and anthropology. Um, and I can only thank heaven there was no math in it or I would still be there working on it. Math is not my forte. Bill and I married shortly after graduation and I worked assorted jobs, none of them fun, you know, the, the jobs you get when you first get out of college. Um, and finally, we made the decision that if we wanted to make the museum happen, because he was as involved in it as I was, if we, were going to, if we were going to make it happen, we had to focus on it, even if it meant less money coming in. So I left the Virginia Employment Commission where I was then working, and I assure you, it did not break my heart. Um, our first exhibit was for Amherst County Day at the high school. We got permission to tear several walls off of a decrepit log cabin and mounted on it whatever uh, antique farming equipment we could find, as well as some of Daddy's antique lawn guns. It wasn't sexy, but it got lots of interest and began to bring in money. And when we reached $64 in the museum bank account, we were ecstatic. We had money. It was wonderful. <laughs> in the summer of 1974, I was named the acting director. We were given the use of the old jail building across from the courthouse that fall, which was generous, but the building did come with a few issues. Um, there was minimal heat in parts of the building, and in the winter, I had to pour antifreeze into the toilet every day. Mm -hmm. um, the fire department siren was on the roof and shook the building when it went off. There was a major leak in the ceiling, which Bill rep repaired with an ingenious chute system, not a bang bang chute, but a chute thing. Um, lucky for us, he had worked construction in, in college during the summers. He and my grandfather, who was then with the um, uh, Appalachian Power Company, rewired the building, and being a thrifty Scotsman, Bill retrieved a Chesapeake and Potomac sign from the garbage, painted it, lettered the museum's, museum's name on it, and hung it on the porch. And I, I think they've still got it, and I won't swear to them. Daddy coaxed other bankers into helping buy a security system for the building, 
trustees from the jail next door mowed the grass and the garden club kept everything else beautiful. For our first exhibit in our new quarters, Bill and I got permission to retrieve a bean from the site of Trader Hughes's cabin, which is now up on the parkway. It was, it was in the parkway when Hughes lived there, but the place had long ago collapsed. It was pretty much just a big pile of rocks. So I was so excited when we got there because this was, this was really the start of the museum as, as far as we were concerned. And I raced up the pile of rocks and I started looking down, looking for good beams. And what I found were copperheads coming out of every crevice in the pile. And I tell you, I got down there a whole lot faster than I went up <laughs> um, and didn't do that again. Um, a grant for an assistant freed me up to write more grants and to give programs to anybody at all who would let me in to talk, particularly schools. And in the spring of 1976, we published our first quarterly bulletin, uh, which was printed on a mimeograph machine. That's how long ago it was. And we had the formal ribbon cutting to open the Amherst County Historical Museum um, that fall, too. It, it, it really was a community effort. It's just amazing how it all came together. But money was short and we needed so many supplies. Bill contacted Representative Caldwell Butler, I'm sure a number of you remember him, um, and asked his help in changing legislation so that small museums like ours could purchase used and cast off goods and materials from federal storage units. I have seen tanks and planes in those places. They're just amazing. Um, the, uh, uh, Mr. Butler's letter to him in October of 1976 saying the bill had been passed still hangs on the wall in their house. He was very proud of that. That same summer, I was accepted into the 18th Annual Williamsburg Seminar for Historical Administrators, and we got to stick our nose in any place we wanted to go in that whole complex. And this was long before the museums were built. The collections at that time were housed in warehouses. I mean, like metal warehouses. And I remember vividly walking in there and seeing 17th and 18th century tables and chairs and Lord knows what else stacked clear to the ceiling. And Mr. Ivor Noel Hume, who was famous in restoration circles and was the head of collections, was staggered when everybody in the class showed up on an off day to see the collection. It was, I don't know how the others felt, but I thought it was glorious. Uh, and the new museums, if you haven't been there, I was just there last week, they are really nice. Um, spring 1977, Bill and I self-published our first book, A History of the County for Fourth Graders. That emboldened us to go on and write the first Passages book and eventually an updated longer history. Then we tackled the free black history of Amherst based on a document I had found in the stacks at the Virginia State Library. By this time, I had made so many trips to the Virginia State Library to do research. Everybody there knew me. Normally, they don't let people into the stacks, but they let me. And they had a whole wall on Amherst County, and they let me go in there and take my notebooks and write what I wanted to. There was this one book, and to this day, I cannot tell you why I picked that book up, because it was listed on the binding as deeds and tax records. But when I flipped through it, I found it actually contained a regist register free blacks with the most incredible information. Um, free persons of color back then were required to register with the county where they lived. It's amazing material. You should know as much about your ancestors as the descendants of these people do. It was physical descriptions of each person, family connections, what they did for work, where they lived. It was just amazing. So. Bill and I wrote a book on that subject, and the second expanded edition of it is still in print and still in demand, I'm happy to say. I get calls from some of the strangest peoples on Ancestry wanting this information. Oh, I finally get it right, didn't I? <laughs> um, spring, uh, oh, wait a minute. Lost my place. Um, that same year, I flew to New York to spend a week with one of my dearest friends, Jane Piper Gleason, whom I had met at Sweetwater. We are both book nuts, and so we're ecstatic to find a really lovely, crowded, dirty old book, uh, and bookstore in, in New York. And uh, it also carried historic documents, and among them was an antique, uh, uh, modern, but an antique replica of the Fry Jefferson map of Virginia, which is extremely rare. Um, and while I salivated trying to figure out how in the world I was going to pay for it, 
J.D. Bless Her Heart went to the manager and bought the map for the Amherst Museum, so that's how we attained that particular treasure. But by late 1979, Bill and I were considering moving to Texas, which is his home. I th he, he wanted to go home, and I thought it would give me some new opportunities, too. Of course, I hadn't been through a Texas summer at that point. <laughs> Might not have felt that way. Um, that fall, I resigned from the Amherst Museum, knowing it would be in good, experienced hands, and I began jockeying. Early in 81, I moved to Galveston, Texas, an island best known for its hurricanes. Bill arrived with their dogs in a loaded trailer several months later after his classes at CBCC ended. I had been hired as director of the Galveston County Historical Museum, which was housed in a huge, old, turn-of-the-century bank building near the harbor. It still had its bank sign up on top, the original sign, which meant that every time a Russian ship dropped anchor in the harbor, we could expect a herd of sailors coming to change their rubles because we were the first building they could see from the harbor and they knew the word bank. Didn't know any others, but they knew bank. If mm -hmm. any of you ever watched Walker, Texas Ranger, Bill and I used to enjoy watching it just to see where they filmed it. One night we turned it on and they were filming in my office in that building. <laughs> Why couldn't you have done that while I was there? <laughs> um, the museum also sponsored a Civil War reenactment group. Every fall they staged either the Battle of Galveston or the Surrender of Galveston. Guess which one was more popular. Um, but the first problem as far as I was concerned was that they were storing their black powder for the guns and the cannons in the damp basement of the museum. Mm -hmm. Now, if you knew my dad, you know I grew up shooting black powder firearms, which he collected. And I knew there was enough firepower down there to lift every building on the block off its foundations. When I pointed this out to the gentleman in the reenactment re 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 group, I'll get it out, um, I was told, well, if it was going to blow up, it would have done it by now. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> I will not entertain you with my response, but uh, the gunpowder disappeared not long after, and I don't know where it went, and I don't care. Then I learned that the previous director had been uh, using the reenactment group's gun license to buy and sell guns, and I'm not talking antiques here. I discovered this when a truck pulled up one day and began unloading cases of guns into the museum. Again, I will spare you my comments, but the guns left too, and not, were not brought back. And I eventually left too, having been offered a job at Ashton Villa, one of Galvis's most foremost um, Victorian attractions. At Ashton, um, I ran the gift shop and the ballroom rentals until I was promoted to curator, first one in the Galveston Historical Foundation system. My boss there was a retired librarian who was the master of putting on dog and pony shows. Christmas especially about killed the staff because she had things going on every minute of every day. Um, I learned a lot from her though, and she and I corresponded for years after I left Galveston, and, um, and, she, and we corresponded until she died from cancer several years later. Now, Galveston Historical Foundation owned and operated several historic houses besides Ashtonville, and eventually they bought themselves a boat too. The Alyssa was a tall masted sailing ship uh, from the oh, mid to late 19th century, which they had found literally on the other side of the world and brought back to Galveston to restore. Basically though, Alyssa was just a big hole in the wall into which GHF poured money. Money which was also needed by the several houses they owned, which caused just a little bit of friction between the various facilities. Every fall, GHF took Alyssa out for sea trials. They would sail down Galveston Harbor and into the Gulf of Mexico for a short distance. They took big donors along and occasionally staff. And in 1983, my number in the staff lottery came up thanks to a friend I worked with at another house museum there on the island. Now, I can't swim and I don't like heights. Still, thanks to the seasick pill they gave all of us as we boarded, I did pretty well until I finally, it finally dawned on me while all those people were hanging over the side of the ship. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'll give you a clue, they were not admiring the waves. Um, even the crew was dropping like flies that day. The captain of the USS Constitution was on board sailing with us that day, and I think he was the only person there who was happy as a clam or who enjoyed the chili, fresh fruit, and tortillas we were offered for lunch. 
And I'm here to tell you there was a lot of that left at the end of the day. Finally, we turned to sail back in, except the ship dropped anchor in the middle of Galveston Harbor. And Margaret and my friend and I looked at each other and thought, what, were they going to pitch us land lovers into the bay? Then the Alyssa crew began to uh, break out rope and board ladders and heave them over the side of the ship. Margaret and I looked at each other again and said, my God, were they going to make us walk the plank? As a matter of fact, that's what they were making us do. Um, it, at the bottom of the very flimsy, narrow steps on the ladder, there was an even flimsier, even narrower board that would allow us to cross over water and into the back end of a, a cruiser that was taking everybody back to the, to the docks. And I looked at Margaret and said, okay, tell them to send my next check here because I'm going to stuck on this boat for the rest of my life. I will never get off of this thing. Fortunately, one of the Ashenville blacksmiths also worked on Alyssa. And he knew me and he saw my panic and he very kindly guided me down the ladder and across while I closed my eyes, being a very brave person. Only later did we learn why the ship had not gone back into the dock. It's because they were uh, reinforcing it for bad weather which was a good thing because of Hurricane Alicia hit the next year. And the last time I was in Galveston, that particular excursion was still known as Green Tuesday. <laughs> and we all were. But I did learn something that day. I now know why my ancestors came to Virginia in the early 1600s and never went back to England because who would want to do that twice? Uh, Galveston, for ne nearly a century, also hosted a huge Mardi Gras celebration. When it was finally rejuvenated in Galveston in 1986, I curated the first and the second exhibits at my old Galveston County Museum. Um, and I remember vividly standing on a ladder on a very high, narrow mezzanine, listening to the reports of the explosion of the Challenger coming in. Of course, Galveston is just down the road from NASA, so we all knew somebody there. It was a very difficult time. Um, I had come back to, to that museum at the request of the Galveston Historical Foundation, which was now running it. Um, it seems that the Board of Supervisors finally realized when I tried to tell them uh, and recognize the da great damage my old board, which was 40-some people, uh, was causing. By the time I had done the second exhibit, Bill and I had moved to Sherman in North Texas near the Red River. I was hired as the first full-time professional director of the uh, Sherman, Sherman Historical Museum. And I also served on the board of Sherman Preservation League, which owned an old mansion they were trying to restore. I loved my work at the museum, though I did get tired of giving tours to firemen in three o'clock in the morning when the fire alarm went off for some reason nobody could ever figure out. I, don't, I had no idea what I told those people. But they were happy, they were bored, it was something to do, so they were happy, and uh, sometimes I thought they actually set the alarm off occasionally <laughs> when they were really bored. But the real problem was that after 12 years in four museums, I was really sincerely tired of board members who differed from me, sometimes drastically, on how the museum should be run. If you're gonna hire a director, let the director do her work. My first board chairman, Sherman, for example, expected me to work seven days a week, or a salary of about $15,000 a year. And you can only butt your head against that, that wall so many times until it starts to hurt. Now, all through these 12 years I've been in museums, I've also been writing. It's usually for work. Exhibit guides, newspaper articles about the museums, brochures, grant applications, whatever. So in the fall of 1987, I took the plunge and resigned to write full time. I started out small, writing for local publications and newspapers until I had enough clips, as they're called in publishing. I began winning awards and competitions I entered, that was more clips, and I sucked up my courage to join a local writing group there in Sherman, which met regularly to critique each other's manuscripts. The head of that group was a retired English teacher who took no prisoners. And if Jesse said you had something wrong, you definitely had something wrong. I still remember her critique of one line in a novel I was writing the first and only time I have ever attempted that. It was based on a real Texas woman from the 19th century, and in one scene, I had her riding down a muddy road, her horse's hooves throwing up sand behind her. I should have said kicking. 
Jesse put her head down on the table as, and it just did everybody else at the table and wailed with laughter. To this day, the few remaining members still tease me about it, and I have never, ever, ever met another horse throw up again. <laughs> the other important thing I learned from the experience was the trained historians find it very hard to write fiction. We just can't find it in ourselves to change events from how they actually happen. It gives us a headache. So I ended Sophia Porter's adventures and went for reality. And during this time, I was also teaching elder hostel classes uh, under the auspices of Austin College there in Sherman, where Bill had gone to school. My first big break came when I was started writing regularly for True West, Texas Highways, and Texas Parks and Wildlife magazines. Then in 1991, I agreed to write on contract a history of Grayson County where we lived. It took two years because of problems with the first publisher. It turned out pretty well in the end, and I began to get more requests to speak to groups. I joined Texas Press Women and later judge writing competitions for the National Press Women. I also joined Western Writers of America. That was a little too much Cowboys and Jeans for me, and I left, finally left. But on April 13, 1993, Bills in My Lives Changed Forever. I couldn't have children, and we had finally gone to the Gladney Center for Adoption in Fort Worth, the oldest such agency in Texas and one of the oldest in the country. And on April 13th, we got the call. And we rushed to Fort Worth to meet our eight-day-old daughter, Ann Elizabeth. I vividly remember afterwards holding her in my left arm while I corrected galleys with my right hand. She's now made us grandparents, which still makes me go what sometimes um, in my mind. Um, and she's, she's been a joy. And with any, the least hint of interest, I will pull out pictures of my grandchildren. So just be aware. Um, I'll interject here that several years later, Bill took a job in Fort Worth and we moved to the area. And I was thrilled to meet Mrs. Gladney's actual descendants who lived in Fort Worth. I got to know them when the Gladney Center for Adoption hired me to help develop an historical dis in, um, um, setup um, for their new campus. The family finally eventually gave me exclusive access to all of Mrs. Gladney's surviving papers, which I used to write a book about her. And if you've ever watched Blossoms in the Dust with Greer Garson, that is not how it happened. Uh, although she and, and Mrs. Gladney were good friends. One day in 1997, I received a call from the W.B. Munson Foundation in a neighboring town. Mr. Munson had made a fortune in the late 19th and early 20th centuries as a banker and cattle baron. But he also had a brother named Thomas Bowling, who was fascinated with grapes. Grapes. He was fascinated. He set out to learn all he could about American grapes and work to see how he could improve them. And most of us would never have ever heard of him if it hadn't been for an itty bitty bug called phylloxera. It's an American bug and it loves to eat grapevine roots which was okay until it made its way across the Atlantic to France and other European grape-growing countries uh, in the mid-19th to mid century. The bug was overjoyed to find rootstock there to be so much easier to eat than American grapes, which have a harder skin. Soon, vineyards across Europe and later around the world were literally dying on the vine. The economies tanked and no one could figure out how to salvage anything from the disaster, except for Thomas Foley Munson. He advocated splicing American rootstock onto the afflicted vines. You can't say that he completely saved the day because many vendors refused to use our, our rootstock. I mean, after all, where did the buck come from? America, that was a no-brainer, we don't want it. But many did try it and were successful. Uh, and the reason we still have wines is because of Thomas Bowling Munson. Uh, because eventually, almost every vineyard in every part of the world have been affected by it in one way or another. It's, it's been an enormous um, loss. Um, and the grateful French nation gave him the Legion of Honor. Now, why have I bothered you with all this? Because that phone call from the W.B. Munson Foundation was to offer me a paying gig, including paying for research in France, like I'm going to say no, uh, in order to write Volney's story. I ended up doing the book uh, with Dr. Roy Renfro, who has judged wine competitions with Wolfgang Puck, and had res resurrected Bowley's work at Grayson County College, just north of us. Roy was the great guy, and I was the writer in this story. The competition is so huge that it's done in stages. You're 
you go through, uh, you classify by your language. Um, and it's, it's, so it's done in stages, and as that fall moved on, and we kept winning more and more categories, thanks to Edward, I would call home and tell Mama about it. And her response always was, who would have thought a book about grapes would do this? I, I certainly didn't. Um, Bill and I left Anne with a friend's family and dashed off with Roy to Orbros, Sweden. We dined in a castle, we met Oprah's chef, and much to our surprise, we actually did win. Four years later, Roy and I revised the book with much new historical material I'd found and published it with the Wine Appreciation Guild in California. And again, came a call from Edward. That year's event would be at the Frankfurt Germany Book Fair, the largest in the world, where he was honoring the best food and wine books of the past 12 years. This time, our daughter Anne joined us as we explored that area, and again, our book won. And um, this is a copy that's I'm donating to the library if you are interested in reading it. Um, I have written a number of books since that experience, but none have had the impact on my life that months and hands. Roy is now retiring, and I present the programs, including two next month. One to the Texas Wine and Great Gorse Association. That one's got me a little skittish. Um, sadly, I know that there will never be another edition because of Roy's health and his retirement from Grayson College. So what have I done since then? Last year, I was asked, asked to take a, volunteer, a position, a voluntary one, as the archivist of the Women's Club of Fort Worth, which I have belonged to for more than 20 years. And I will be writing a new history of the club for our centennial in 2023. It will be the 25th book I have authored, co-authored, or contributed to. And I spent a lot of time on this trip making, working on the proposal for it. I thank you again for being here. It's been a wonderful experience. Thank you again, Tim, for setting this up. Thanks to all of you for listening. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to try and answer them. suitcase, so I copied the covers of some of them if you'd like to look at them up here later. Any questions that you'd like to know more about? I know more about grapes than I ever thought. I mean, <laughs> the, the great people have nothing on me anymore. Did you um, live on Kenmore Road at some point? No, we lived on Sunset. Sunset, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Mama lived just off Kenmore um, oh, okay. right after Daddy died. Okay. Then it was your mom, I knew. Okay, yes. If she was on okay. Kenmore, that's mm -hmm. mom. Yeah. Did you ever get to tell Mr. White how much of an impact did he make? No, no, I never I never did. Yeah. I, I don't even know where he is anymore. I was going to say, whatever happened to him. I have no idea. But. I always would love for teachers to know, because my daughter mm -hmm. had some of it mm -hmm. way back in the past. Yeah. Uh, well, this is Seaman. Dr. Seaman kept a real eye on me at Sweet Briar, too. Um, and she's the one who got me into the aftermath of Camille Project and uh, got me into all these wonderful um, um, people uh, giving programs, which I would really shouldn't have been at because I wasn't a student anymore at that point. Um, but she thought it was important for me, and I actually corresponded with Dr. Goodall several times um, over the years. But sitting in that Washington, D.C. airport drinking coffee and <laughs> bourbon was <laughs> a real experience. Uh, any other questions I can try and answer? You went through the experience pretty quick about adopting a daughter and mm -hmm. writing a book. Can you expand on that? Okay. Yeah, it's a lot of work. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I already had several contracts going for books when we got the, so you don't know with, with Gladney, you don't know when you're going to get the call, come and get her. So we, we had to be prepared at all times and it was only on the way to, to um, Fort Worth that we realized we didn't have a diaper pan, can, we didn't have a number of other things that we were supposed to have had uh, put together. And <clears throat> we got there and we didn't see her for a while. You have to go through all the paperwork. And I had no idea what we told them or what they told us. I couldn't tell you to this day. We just signed wherever they pointed and went on. 
and um, um, it's it's been a, a real experience. They told us she was uh, mostly Hispanic, and as she got older, we began to question that. And so a couple of years ago, she and I had our DNA test done, and as we thought, she's mostly Western Native American, mm -hmm. and both of her babies look just like her. They have that dark hair, dark eyes, a slightly darker skin complexion, um, and um, uh, it's 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 been a real experience. Sometimes a little more interesting than other times, but anybody who knew the stream was a parent has been through that one. Um, and I. I've enjoyed getting to know Mrs. Gladney's family, and they've been very generous with me about letting me have whatever I want, I need, I want to work on a book about her. Um, this is the, the cover. This, this was a paperback done by um, History Press in Charleston. Um, and it's, it's been a puzzle to me that it hasn't that it hasn't gotten more response than it has. I mean, we can't be the only adopted, pa adopted parents in the country. Um, but it, it opened a lot, of, a, a lot of other doors. And that's the thing about writing, is that one door opens sometimes two, three, four other doors. And it's kind of intimidating and it's fascinating at the same time. Um, I'm not sure if I, if I were still... Well, I don't know that I'd do anything differently. What the heck? Um, Bill and I worked on some of the early books together, so his name is on it, uh, which are all the early ones. Um, and he is still my first line writer, editor. He's the first one that sees anything that I write. And um, uh, so right now I'm working on a proposal to um, the Center for Texas Studies at the Texas Christian University in Fort Worth. Uh, for um, a book on the centennial of the Women's Club of Fort Worth. And they've shown great interest in it, and I have worked on it most nights. I've, I've, been, I've, I've been in Virginia two weeks now, and I spent most nights working on it. Because I gotta get it out pretty soon. Um, our centennial begins in 2022, and that's not very far off in writing terms. Um, I, I don't think. Bill's going to be seeing a whole lot of me at, at some points. Um, but we work, he and I work together very well. And I finally became bold enough to say, okay, if he would suggest something, I would say, no, I don't like that. And I would read it the way it was. That was a big step for me. Um, because I think Bill is a college teacher and he's older than I am. And um, so it was, it was hard to get that going the first time. But now he knows when I say no, that's not the way I want it. That's not the way it's going to be. Um, but he's, he's, he will read everything I write before it goes out. It's nice to have an editor in-house. Any other questions? Do you self-publish or do you have a, a publisher you use? Or? Our first several books we self-published. In fact, we did them in, uh, uh, what was the name? They were in Forest. <laughs> what was the name of that publishing that, um, company? I can't remember. But our first two or three books we self-published, and that gives you, if you, if you can publish them, get them published and, and sold, that gives you an end to getting into a publisher. And I've worked with a number of different publishers at this point, some of which I wish I'd never heard of. Um, and some of them have been really wonderful. Well, speaking of that, um, what are some questions you wish you had asked before you got signed up with the publishers you didn't care for? What are the important things that writers should keep in mind when looking for Well, publishers? first of all, you need to understand that you're going to have to do a lot of work before they ever start working. They are going to give you pages and pages of things they want information on. Who's the audience? How many books are we going to sell? How soon can you get it to us? Um, is there going to, are there going to be pictures? Um, I did two books with History Press. And um, the first one went, went well, but for the second one, 
which was a book about Texas women who had been the first to do something or be something or whatever. The press assigned me a 20-something bearded, burly boy. And we did not speak the same language. Um, and he didn't like anything I wrote, and I didn't like anything he said. Um, and I, I actually threatened several times to, to drop the project before they got him off my back. So it's, it's if, you, if you get a good, a good editor, a good, a good uh, reader, he goes along pretty smoothly, but it's not always that way. Um, and uh, I'm expecting some of the same with this book on the Women's Club because every woman who's been in that club for more than five years is going to have an opinion on what I should put in there. And if I put everything in there they wanted, it would be this thick. And no publisher would pick it up and nobody could pick them up. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's, sometimes you just have, sometimes you can be polite and say, no, I don't think that's right and this is why. And sometimes you just have to say, no, that's not the way it's going to happen. I mean, I've written more books than anybody in the club, so I think I know a little more than they do. Not, not to be arrogant about it, but um, this, this ain't my first time at the rodeo, as they say in Texas. <laughs> uh, but um, you need to research the publisher very carefully. Most of them nowadays have forms already set up. This is what we want to know. And, you, and it, sometimes they'll be 10 to 15 pages long. And you've got to work your way through all of that because if you don't give them the information, they're going to call you and say, we need this information. Um, so it's a, in some ways, it's easier than the way it used to be when you just told them, this is what I'm going to send you. And in other ways, it's a lot more of a pain uh, because some stuff they will have on the forms doesn't apply to you. you know, if I'm writing a, 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 a mystery novel, it's a, they're not going to care how many um, um, women I'm going to talk about in the book. So it's, and, and publishing is changing. Publishing is changing almost every day. So it's, it's difficult, it can be difficult to keep up with it uh, in, in the book market. Um, but I, I've, I've not written anything uh, for the last eight years because of some family things we had going on. So I'm having to really push myself to get back into it now. I'm working on a, a fiction novel. Mm -hmm. and I haven't published any things, my first one. But one thing, you got to go with the rules of the day. And as I understand it today, you're writing for a short attention span readers. How does that translate to nonfiction? People who read nonfiction generally don't have that short attention span problem, particularly if they're historians. I mean, we will write, but we will read for hours and hours at a time, and I've done it. Um, that's a tough one, because at some point you just have to say, this is my book, this is the way I want it, and if you don't like it, I will go find another publisher. And that's not fun. Yeah. But sometimes you have to do it, because they have they're not grasping the concept of what you're trying to do. And if you let them roll over you, they will do it. It's, it's um, more difficult than it was when I started out, or about years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I, that. Um, but I wish you luck on that. I, I tried fiction, as I told you, and it was a real bad mistake. Uh, historians just cannot write fiction. At least most of us can't. How critical do you think it is for you to have a social media pre presence? It is important and I should have more than I do, but it takes so much time and I am so bad at computer stuff. <laughs> that, I mean, I can find dead people on my computer, but asking me to put together, um, and I find a lot of dead people on my computer, <laughs> um, asking me to, um, to do something like that my brain's just not wired to it. And, and that's been a problem for me because it, it, it causes difficulties. Um, but in the end, just remember, it's your baby, not theirs. They're gonna make money off your baby, but hopefully you will too. So you mentioned all your 
historic research and that you got into areas that normally people wouldn't get into. What advice would you give people about how to be persistent and you know, find ways to do your research? Well, I'm just ornery and hard-headed, so that helps. Um, and you, be quiet. <laughs> My sister-in-law, she knows what you want. Uh, um, it's, it's a real fine line, and it just it depends on the publisher. Big publishers, I don't mess with because they're just too much trouble. I like the smaller presses. They give you more attention. They listen to you better. Um, now, uh, and, and I've done several through academic presses, and that's probably what this book will be, uh, because um, the Center for Texas Studies is, is interested in this. They specialize in, you uh, know, Fort Worth. Um, there's no real easy answer to that one. Just I like finding it, the book that that you that said one thing, but you found it was the treasure trove and mm -hmm. all those other things. Mm -hmm. You just have um, to dig really deep into yeah. some of that, those archives and things, yeah. right? Yeah, and fortunately, that's what I love. I'd so much rather be in a museum with a, in, a, in a library with a bunch of dead books than with real people. <laughs> <laughs> they don't talk back to me or ask me to do 500 things. Um, and I have a lot of research coming up when I, when I get back from this trip. I have at least four university libraries I've got to get to. Um, before I can start writing um, this history for the women's club. But that's the part I like, because you never know what you're going to find. Is that um, the favorite part of writing? The mm -hmm. research and what you find? If out. you write a history, yeah. yeah. It's, it's what you find that you weren't expecting. Um, and that's that's the fun. Uh, Eric, the executive director of their club, I know she's a sweet lady, but I know she must get tired of my roaring in the door saying, Sonny, Sonny, look what I found today. Uh, and, but I do, I get excited about it. Nobody else has seen this in years and years and years. And it's, um, it's, it's a rush. And uh, sometimes you overturn people's ideas of what it was or what it was supposed to be, but that's okay too. Nothing is written in stone anymore. Any other questions I can try and answer? Well, I really appreciate y'all coming out like this. This is, this is just great. And to celebrate you as a favored daughter of the county. It's important for us to celebrate uh, those, especially those that tell stories, because that's what our culture is built on, is the stories. And if your historians don't capture them and preserve them, and clearly some people have talent for that, and uh, others of us don't. <laughs> But uh, they passed a resolution in your honor, and I'd like to, I'd like to read it. Okay. This is commemorative resolution number six for 2021. A commemorative resolution honoring Sherry Sneed McElroy, McElroy for her work recording and preserving Amherst County history. Be it resolved by the Board of Supervisors of the County of Amherst, Virginia, the Board of Supervisors of the County of Amherst, Virginia, now honors and thanks Sherry Sneed McLeroy for her work as a historian. Whereas, Sherry was part of the Amherst High School class of 1970. And whereas, she received her BA with high honors in history and anthropology from Sweetbriar College. And whereas, she went on to be the founding director of the Amherst County Historical Museum and whereas she has written, contributed to, or co-authored at this writing, 24 <laughs> books, many of them about uh, Amherst County history. And whereas many of her books and articles are available in the Amherst County Public Library. And whereas Sherry is being honored as a, in a homecoming celebration at the Madison Heights Branch Library on October 4th, 2021. Now therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Supervisors of the County of Amherst, Virginia, that the Board of Supervisors of the County of Amherst, Virginia now welcomes Sherry Sneed with the Roy back to her hometown of Amherst County. Be it further resolved that the Board congratulates Ms. McLeary on all her work recording the history of Amherst County and expresses their gratitude 
for her work preserving this history for generations to come. This resolution will be in force and effect upon adoption and adopted the 21st day of September. Signed Jennifer R. Moore, the chair of the Board of Supervisors. cash collection. Uh, um, we have um, 400 glass negatives and this is one of those. Did he the station? He did. Yeah, if you can't get it in your suitcase, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can ship it to you. I think one of them is going to be one of those. Oh, wow. Taken sometime between um, 1895 and 1900, well, 1915. Okay. Well, that's wonderful. Let's just take a walk around here so everybody can see it. So, and thank you for all your guidance. Oh, you're very special. Oh, you're welcome.